Welcome to the online course Essentials of Youth Policy, organized by the partnership between the European Commission and the Council of Europe in the field of youth. So welcome everyone to the first webinar of uh, MOOC on Essentials of Youth Policy. I'm Laimonas Rogauskas, one of the facilitators of the webinar and the course. Um, and the webinar and the whole course is brought to you by the partnership between European Commission and the Council of Europe in the field of youth. So they are the, the organizers and initiators of the Massive Open Online course. Um, and uh, within the course, we're gonna have four webinars in total. Um, this is the first webinar and today our focus is on main actors and their interdependencies and cooperation between them for the sake of building uh, and implementing a better youth policy. Um, the webinar is recorded now and later it will be available uh, both on the uh, partnerships uh, Facebook page as well as in the MOOC uh, online environment on canvas.net there we have a discussion call uh, in within the module two and module two kind of covers basics on youth policy and there we have session 2.4 and just after that session we have a discussion about actors about their interdependencies and cooperation and we already have actually 25 people who posted their answers um, what is important and what actors should be involved and i believe there will be many more uh, questions and discussion going on after this webinar. So you'll, you'll, you'll find the recording uh, by tomorrow there. So actually without further ado, we jump into the content of the webinar. And uh, today we have uh, Ms. Miriam Thelma, who will be our guest speaker and uh, will ignite the, the discussion further on. Uh, she is active in the field of youth for quite a while. And I think those, those who are in the field uh, already met Miriam somewhere in Europe and I will perhaps ask Miriam to introduce yourself uh, at the very beginning uh, what do you do how are you related to the youth field um, so the time is yours and then after roughly half an hour 35 minutes there will be time to um, to have questions and answers and then we will finish by uh, three o'clock central European time Miriam, the floor is yours. Hello, Laimanas. Hello, everyone who's online this afternoon. You asked me who I am to introduce myself. I mean, I was already seeing some names coming up and whom I have met throughout the, the time I've been involved in the youth field. I mean, I, can, I come from a small island in Malta. And uh, as much as it can be an, a disadvantage, it's also an advantage because you end up wearing quite a number of hats or experiencing quite different things. And therefore, I mean, I always really find it hard to introduce who I am because I've, I've gone through so many, so, so many experiences in the youth field. I started wor working as a volunteer in the youth field, have developed one of the NGO, main NGOs that we have on the island. And I worked there um, for 10 years, so I lived the life of NGOs, and uh, and I'm honest. You have said today we're going to talk about the actors of youth policy, and as I'm going to go through a little bit my experience in a way, these are all actors. Uh, so just to show that. Uh, in a way, there are so many actors involved. One of my my first time that I started sort of re reacting and also got to know what youth policy is about is from myself as a young person being in an NGO. So young people, NGOs, and of course that was part of uh, of the me as a volunteer. Again, volunteers are actors in youth policy. And I, I continued my career besides being a volunteer and working with NGOs. And of course, I didn't remain a young person anymore. I, I was working for the university and I'm still, I'm still work 
um, on a part-time basis at the university. So I was a lecturer for an and still am, in a way, for a number of years, um, which included not only lecturing, but also researching um, young people. And again, then, sort of researchers, lecturers at the, at the university, they are also left the actors in the field. But it, it, I also then moved as uh, in, in, in the ministry. In, uh, we have been working on youth policy in Malta for, since 1993. And I was also always part in this youth policy development. Uh, and uh, one of the things that happened in Malta throughout the years was that we really set a structure to monitor, to see, see the implementation to youth policy and monitor youth policy as well. And therefore now my job is the CEO of this uh, youth agency, which is not really the agency which takes care of uh, Erasmus Plus, but it's really an agency which focuses on uh, and the national youth policy in Malta and also works and, and, and represents Malta on, on with the different stakeholders at a European level. So for some people who are not used to this agency structure or chief executive officer at a European level, they see, they see me as the director general for youth now. And through my job, I'm also now working a lot at EU and Council of Europe level. I mean, myself and another colleague of mine who works at the agency um, represents Malta on the Youth Working Party, which is also a, a, a part where youth policy at EU level is, uh, is uh, um, structured and developed and um, but I happen to be at the time the chair of the steering committee for youth at, at Council of Europe level and again this is another institution um, which works on youth policy structures develops and implements parts of youth policy together with young people which we call the advisory group and therefore together we form a joint council for youth at Council of Europe level to develop foresee and implement the policy of the youth sector of the, out, of the Council of Europe. So in reality, and again, the European Union, the Council of Europe, uh, I mean, the young people working at, European, at, at, at a European level, all these are actors in, in the youth policy field. I mentioned a few, but of course, during um, our, 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 our together, here, I mean, I'm going to mention more, and you may also ask questions and to check or see whether, in reality, you might think of other actors which I might not have um, or will not mention. Um, in reality, when you told me to sort of to be on this webinar, one question that was put to me was why invest in youth policy? I mean, sort of, uh, it's not only the act the actors involved in youth policy, but why should we have an a youth policy? Why should we invest in it? And uh, usually I start talking about what's happening at a European level, but uh, I mean, after these, uh, these uh, years, uh, and also having Malta part of the Commonwealth, maybe some people have not heard about that, and uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, the Commonwealth has, in a way, gathered together quite a number of countries who are at the beginning, it started off who were colonized by the British, but uh, I mean, now there are others which, which aren't. And this also gave me a broader perspective of, uh, uh, in a way, the world rather than just Europe. Uh, and perhaps uh, we forget that in the world there are 1.8 billion young people between 10 to 24. I mean, uh, young people and the concept of youth varies in its significance. Uh, and the range uh, of age for youth policy, it varies from culture to culture. But one thing I have really sort of always come across in each and every country, I mean, I interacted with was that, I mean, one universal thing is that the, 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 the idea of trans, the transitional concept. So young people uh, in a way are in a transition and I think, uh, um, on most of the countries look at young people in transition and this is one thing which I think we are 
all we all agree ab about because there are a lot of arguments and disagreements of what we should agree or what should youth policy be and what it shouldn't be but one thing that definitely everybody puts forward is this transitional concept can you can you yeah. uh, uh, mention miriam transition yeah. from where to where Yes, I mean, and there are different transitions. I mean, the transition from a child to an adult, from school to work, from living into your family and home to going to live independently, from living with a family and moving on to living in a relationship with someone. I mean, these are all transitions that uh, in a way many times happen during the age between 13 and 30, you know, so, uh, so this is why we're, uh, of course, there are others as well, uh, depending on the cultures, uh, because, um, but mainly in Europe, these are the transitions um, that we usually um, to talk about. Uh, I mean, so, so that's, that's, so young people are quite a big cohort in society, and one thing is why should we invest in new policy is, is because of this. I mean, another thing which uh, we don't really speak about a lot, and even if we look at a lot of the coursework that um, and probably everyone who has joined in this MOOC has already written and have seen some of the videos already, we are always identifying, identifying young people as a resource. And that's one of, in a way, our key elements of youth policy. We're always talking that in youth policy, I mean, young people are the resource. Um, youth policy is something positive, uh, something which we should let you look at young people as so young people who have, are, have, are full of energy, they have a, a lot of ideas, it's worth investing in them. But uh, I, throughout my experience, and if you tell me why, should we invest in, in, in youth policy? I would not mention that thing as a first thing. I mean, if we look at social policy rather than youth policy, social policy is also always based on is whether there is a problem. And depending on the problem, we act to try and so give solutions to the problem because many times we don't solve the problem, but we try and give solutions to the problem. And this is what youth pol what policy is about. And I also see as, as and I saw also see an aspect of youth policy which is which is so as well. And sometimes we forget all about this because we're always saying that youth policy is positive, but but in reality, policy is reacting to what's happening around us in society. And what's happening, therefore, if we're talking about youth policy, what's happening to young people eh, around us? Uh, and, and in reality, I mean, the global situation of young people today is quite, there are quite striking, striking paradoxes uh, in this. I mean, there's an extreme uh, um, disparity in terms of the economic, technological, sociological, social and cultural resources. Um, between the regions, between the countries, between the, the, the localities, between, between groups. I mean, perhaps we are, don't realize that almost 85% um, live in a developing country. I mean, we look at Europe as a, develop, as, uh, as a developing country, but I mean, despite also the mass of ur urbanization and the fact that I mean, there are quite a few places which have been urbanized. I mean, we still have that the majority of young people live in rural areas. I mean, we think that everybody is living in a city, but in reality, if you look at the globe, at, at the world, a lot of young people live in rural areas. And we, this was something that we never used to talk about it in Europe, but even in Europe, there are a lot of young people living in, our, in rural areas and lately we have put as one of our youth goals uh, and to w work with young people with uh, rural areas so as you are um listening to me in a way and um, i'm trying to sort of portray that 
youth policy, investing is youth, in youth policy, and youth policy is a response to what's happening around us, the fact that we have a big number of young people, the fact that there is an extreme disparity of economic and technological, social and cultural change, the fact there are there's a big difference between young people living in an urbanized and society and young people living in rural society. And, and these changes in socio-economic and policy structures, in a way, um, are making young people living quite a precarious life, more than we think so. So there are the young people who are coming from, from a very developed country. And in a way, today, even if we look at statistics, we can say that they're the most educated um, group of young people we ever had in the world. And, uh, and then there are another group of young people who are still literate, who have still have no education. And both these groups uh, have their own problems. Uh, I mean, there is the group uh, who is better educated, uh, I mean, but uh, um, they have the opportunity to go to school. But in today, we are forcing these young people not only to go to compulsory schooling, but continue their further, further education, continue their master's, continue their PhD. And what's happening, that this transition from work from school to work is taking longer. This depend, this independent, this transition from being dependent to independent is taking longer as well. And the delay um, of age of the, of young people to become financially independent is becoming delayed even more than it than it was before. On the other hand, the ones who are vulnerable, I mean, are facing very low wages, are not finding employment. We still have a big um, 66 million of young people throughout the world that are unemployed. I mean, a very, very big group of young people, even in Europe, are unemployed. And that's also um, another problem. And another one is in terms of also health issues. I mean, we also look at the young person with energy um, who has, um, who, whose well-being, um, who, we look at the young person who has a good well-being, who's always healthy and so on, and in reality, um, it's, it's not so. I mean, the research has also, all, is showing us that there are many aspects of vulnerability with regards to health issues for young people. I mean, of course, in underdeveloped countries, um, there are issues like infections and HIV and uh, um, other things where the, we, we don't even have any vaccination which prevents them, or there is a vaccination, but they have no access to it. But in Europe, we also have a lot of violence, suicide, drug dependency, and lately have been talking a lot also about mental health. And in reality, I mean, I'm saying this because I, this has, it, I'm putting the group of young people as a specific social category. And therefore, because it's a specific social category, then this is one reason why should, we should really invest in youth policy. I mean, and I'm also saying this because usually we're always saying positive youth policy, re, young people are resourced and so on. But really, the most uh, we really need to invest in youth policy because this is the situation that we have around us. And therefore, we should respond to it. I mean, in Europe, because we have been talking about youth policy for a number of times, I was telling you that Malta, for example, has had its national, first national youth policy in 1993. And it was at the time when a lot of um, yeah, um, countries in Europe had set their policy. So in Europe, uh, you can say that listen, this does not seem to be an, a, something, a brainer, something which uh, is... Uh, is big to to do and implement because we have been talking and it has it in a way it has um, sunk in and it's the idea of uh, um, having a youth policy has sunk in and even the European institutions like the Council of Europe the European Union have all 
have their own youth policies and member states meet together to set the policies and um, together with these institutions and therefore i i mean the, therefore then why what's the problem what's happening why 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 do we still have these problems why haven't we really come up with uh, um, any solutions to the problems uh, young people are facing today so and, uh, here I mentioned two dimensions. Uh, I mean, it's uh, youth policy has two dimensions: its development and its implementation. In theory, these t these processes are, are intertwined, uh, and that all stakeholders have a shared responsibility in, in the practice uh, to practice uh, and implement this policy. But the developing policy is the easy bit. Every country in Europe has got its own policy documents. They've brought a number of experts together, young people, ministries, uh, researchers, uh, NGOs, uh, youth workers, youth leaders, uh, and they're all brought together around the table because we, are, we have always been trying to say and trying to put forward that we need a number of actors, a number of stakeholders to set up and develop a policy together and uh, not everybody does it the same way but uh, from my experience and if i look at the different the way member states operate i think the idea has completely sunk in in europe that we need to consult we need to have people participating and a lot of these actors are around the paper uh, are around the table to to develop policy so in a way in these past 20 30 years this has become the easy bit everybody has nice policy documents everybody has short long interesting policy documents but the most difficult thing is implementing the policy and what appears to be viable on paper in reality sometimes proves very impractical on the ground I mean, and why? I'm generally in Europe uh, when when we when a country develops its policy, it's usually largely thematic because we talk about education policy, we talk about health policy, we talk about security policy, welfare, defense, and each country is in a way has got its own ministry, has got its own departments, and they've got an, a policy for education, a policy for health, a policy for, um, for defense. But when we're talking about youth or age specific um, cohorts of people, um, things become different. And this is not only in the youth field, it can be in children, it can be in uh, and older people, I mean, because in reality, these young people are going to be part of the education policy, are going to be part of the defense policy, are going to be part of the health policy, and uh, uh, they can be part of the transport policy, environment policy, anything. I mean, but that's still not your policy, that's education policy, that's uh, transport policy. So what is all this youth policy about? And this is what really makes it difficult for us to implement policy and youth policy because uh, I mean when it when it comes to to have it on paper, you can many times if you look at different policies you see you see the youth policy categorized having different sections for education, culture, arts, health, employment, etc, etc. I mean, but then when it comes to implement it, how is this going to be implemented and who is going to implement it? And there is the really difficult part. I mean, are we going to, and therefore people like me who are the Director General for Youth and who are in charge of youth policy and who are in reality always at the forefront to develop policy, sort of uh, the, the, the discussion or the decision is what kind of policy should we have then? So we have all 
in a way convinced ourselves that we have to invest in, in youth policy. And yes, in many countries there is some kind of investment. It's not always not not in every country it's the same, but there's some kind of investment in each country in Europe. And when we say talk about investment, we say we think about people, time, resources, money, ideas, energy, determination. But what how should we make this investment? Should it be a broad approach that may in a way deplete our investment because even though no matter how much we invest, if this is going to be a broad approach, it, it's going to end up in a way as a monster. How, how would I, I, as the people in charge in a youth ministry, which is usually the smallest ministry and in, in the country, sort of, if you look at the broad approach, it's impossible to handle. Or a narrower approach. And when we're talking of a narrower approach, that means uh, sort of dealing with our core issues. Uh, and usually we take core issues such as youth participation, youth information, um, what, youth work, for example. So, so those are the na narrow, uh, narrow things. Uh. So, so that's the dilemma. Should it be a narrow, a broad thing, or a narrow thing, or, or should we adopt a dual approach, which would deal with the narrow issues, but also try to monitor also the other issues in the different ministries, and many times this dual approach we call it the cross-sectoral um, approach. I mean, so the idea over here is that, okay, each and every ministry would really take on its responsibilities, such as education, environment, employment, and so on. The youth ministry would really take up then the, the core issues, not only on its own. I will, as I said, I mentioned, I mentioned NGOs, young people themselves, I mean, the number of people who are in the field, and then having um, a monitoring on how to monitor the whole um, policy. So, and these are always the dilemmas, and this is the difficult thing between, uh, um, uh, because this would bring about a large number of actors. I mean, it will bring about a large number of actors from the different ministries on the thematic issues and also a large number of actors on the core issues which are youth work then that would mean um, getting youth workers on board youth leaders on board um, ngos on board youth information officers whoever has got to do with the young people who are leading the youth organizations whoever is dealing with the core issues is really on board and the, having maybe, the, the, maybe I'm here I could uh, already yeah. link to, to what you say um, we already had questions on the discussion forum in the online course and we'll already have, start having questions here and one of the questions is this um, you know young people on board so it's kind of almost everyone agree on that you know <laughs> that young people should be on board but uh, also people here in the webinar is as, uh, asking like you know, often people are not even members of association and it seems like uh, in the recent years they tend to participate through other forms also, not, not only through organizations. Also in some cases like uh, people from whose opinion especially matter, yeah, because they are maybe more from disadvantaged groups, very often would not have skills to articulate their opinion and for sure they wouldn't like to be involved in any kind of structures. But um, youth policy... I'd say the coordination and implementation often happens through the structures. Um, perhaps any thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, I think about it quite a lot. I mean, because this is a really a very topical issue. How are we going to outreach young people and how are we going to get young people on board? And uh, I'm in, in today, my opinion today, it might change tomorrow or the next day because this, we're growing all the time and experiences might change. 
I mean, my opinion today is that, first of all, we can never get all the young people on board. I mean, uh, because as you said, well said, and said correctly, not all young people are involved in NGOs and structures and so on, and not all young people are interested to get on board. So the, this mania, sometimes I say, to try and get all the young people on board, for me, is a no-go anymore. It's, no, it's, it's not something that I believe in, in anymore. I mean, some young people are not interested to be part of this. I mean, of course, they want us to, to take action and get po put policy measures to, um, to engage with them and, uh, and uh, find them give them space to find employment and so on, but they might not be necessary, necessary interested to really be part of this policy process. So, and I'm not really worried about that if they are really not interested to be part of the policy process. And sometimes we are spending too much energy to try and get everyone on board when it is not necessary. Because, uh, I mean, something which I have not mentioned is that's why research is there. I mean, and there are different types of research that we can we can uh, take up. There's the statistical research that we, many of our the countries today have uh, have uh, got uh, um, their national statistics office and so on. So we can uh, we can gather research which influence policymakers to come up with the best policy measures which depending on the needs and aspirations of the young people living in that in society or in that particular country so as much as young people participating directly in policy making and it's also important to have research which informs policy makers to come up with better policy measures of course that does not mean that we do not include young people i mean one group of young people, the young people who are NGOs and so on, are the young people who are easily, much more easily reached, and we can sort of definitely put them on the table to formulate policy, to go there with the policy makers. But I mean, research is also an, an important um, aspect which we have to take up to um, and be able to know who the young people are and come up with policy actions. Sometimes I think we, um, we think too idealistic in the, way, in the way we talk about youth participation and in the way on how to involve um, young people. As much as it's good to involve young people, it might also be frustrating. I mean, I have been into so many fora and we have a number of structures, I mean, which involve young people. If I look at the Council of Europe, we're all the time um, developing policy together with a group of young people coming from NGOs. But it's only a small group. You can't have all the young people, as much as the policymakers are a small group. If we look at the EU, e EU structures, we, have the, we had the structured dialogue in the past, we have the EU youth um, um, dialogue now, but it's only a small group of young people. And, and the, the challenge is how we are going to involve more, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't involve more, but also the challenges and how are we going to become informed on what the needs and aspirations are, not necessarily by interacting with them, but also from research to try and really come up with good policy measures uh, which can be implemented and can make the young people's lives better. I mean, because uh, there's... Part, participation of young people is not only in policy. There are so many other things that, you know, so, so I don't know whether I got to, uh, whether people are understanding uh, this, uh, but uh, um, I'm seeing a question here, why youth NGOs are not so active in formulating youth policy agenda on national level? Youth NGOs are not part of the policy cycle, circle um, many times. I mean, again, it, it, again, I also say, I mean, and there is no one policy circle. I mean, and each country organizes this diff differently. Um, but it has, and I don't know how many, in how many, I've been into many situations where I really wanted more NGOs to participate in the policy circle, but they were not, in, not they were not interested, they didn't have the time. 
they didn't have the capacity. And therefore, what, what's the role of the policymaker there? I mean, uh, does that mean that those young people are left out in policy? I don't think they are. I think that the role of the policymaker is really to try and see why build their capacity, um, but also try to address them in a different way. Um, and I'm also seeing another another question, which Richard is most wanted now. I don't think there is, a, I mean, that's a question that, what, what do we mean by which youth research is most wanted now? Youth research is, I see youth research as youth research. I mean, we have to, because the way we're formulating policy now, I mean, it's cross-sectorial. So yes, we need youth research on who the young people are, what are their problems, and then focus and then prioritize and focus um, our policy measures depending on the resources, both financial and human, we have. So in reality, I would want an eclectic research to really find out what the young people are. And then it's the policy, and then it's the policy make the people who are developing the policy, the group of people developing policy who make, um, who will make priorities according to that eclectic research. Of course, when we're talking about national youth policy, when we're talking about European youth policy, there's always, there are always the political parties in, involved as well. And again, I mean, this is because we talk sometimes from a very idealistic point of view. I mean, if that political party wants to put those priorities as part of the national youth policy, I mean, it can be a research which, it, the results of the research may be giving us another result, but I mean, because ultimately, if the government is setting those, is going to take action or is setting that policy, I mean, there's always that finger in the pie where the politician would ultimately say, this is what I want to prioritize on. You know, sort of, and this is something that we also forget. I mean, the ideal is that the policy is not of the government, but of the state. But uh, the ideal is different from practice. Yeah. Um, so we have um, more questions appearing. That's actually really mm -hmm. great. We will see how many we can answer. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a few questions actually from uh, Sophie. So Sophie, I don't know if you would be uh, willing to actually just uh, ask one of the questions. One that got quite many votes was about um, good success stories. And I think, yeah, Sophie, we can hear you. So we can... Yes, you can hear me. Maybe you can see me as well, I'm unsure. Um, hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be among all of you and uh, uh, to be able to enjoy this initiative from uh, this uh, webinar and this mock. Well, basically, um, since we've lost Sophie. Oh, we lost her. Let's see what happens. Yeah, Sophie, one more time. Yes, we can see you also on the video now. We just don't yeah. hear you. Hi. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, um, I've lived through this experience of uh, holding various programs with young adults from 14 to 18 in uh, international environment uh, and private sectors at uh, high schools. And uh, with the French Ministry of Justice, with another but um, underprivileged environment in a juvenile retention center, where we created a program with various workshops to endeavor to empower uh, the young adults uh, by giving them some tools in public speaking in front of their peers. No adult involved except uh, a couple of, the, of, of us. And in those two experiences, uh, we've realized that we could, we could combine public authorities, well, for example, the French minister, Ministry of Justice and the private sector to really make a change in the confidence in the uh, self 
uh, assessment of young adults and we could obtain very good results in empowering them in uh, getting organized among themselves without adults to organize meetings to hold uh, responsibilities uh, within meetings and to obtain at the end of those workshops uh, better confident young adult, uh, better empowered and ready to move on um, in their further higher studies or in the other environment, ready to face their lawyer or ready to face their judge, uh, to be more self-aware, conscious uh, of their responsibilities and to be more open and have grown over their negative emotional state. So hence my question and the wish I would like to express uh, to uh, know this NGO better and to see how we could create opportunity for sharing knowledge practice success stories to inspire and give energy to extend uh, any initiative uh, to make a difference. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, um, thank you Sophie. I, I mean, I think you are giving an example on how, uh, how young people can participate, of course, uh, um, at uh, and NGO level, local level, and so on. What I was saying beforehand it was at a much higher level than that, and I definitely agree with I, with these kinds of projects. And there are quite a number of projects that NGOs and even local authorities or regional authorities are are um, organizing. At organizing, I mean, I can give an, an example in Malta this year we had a, a project which was called Polyfest and it was all around different policy issues uh, again like you said justice environment uh, and education and so on where groups of young people are gathering together and uh, talking about what their needs are and then and then um, putting them together in uh, um, different policy statements and presenting them to us as the Ministry for Youth, but also to the different ministries, depending on what um, the, the topic was. And I suggest that there is a, quite an interesting action under Erasmus+, Plus, which is called Key Action 3, but there is also sort of the European Youth Foundation at the Council of Europe, um, which allows um, some uh, some new innovative projects uh, and you can apply for funding uh, um, both for this key action three and both under the european youth foundation of the council of europe for some innovative local project and through both the council of europe and your um and the national agencies which take up erasmus plus i'm sure you can find some partners and um, to get to know what their practices is and also come up with that new practice between the different partners to, to continue further such practices and engage young people to um, speak out, talk about what, they, what their needs are and engage also with a dialogue with the policymakers so that they can listen and also act about their needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, would you have any uh, um, success stories to share? Or maybe you would want to name some country or region that people could dig deeper and say, um, you know, they implemented policy in a, in a youth policy in a good way. They involved important actors. There is a youth voice heard, maybe something from your practice that you could just, uh, I believe uh, presenting the example would take a long time, but at least just like maybe mentioning some so people could go and, and, and discover more. And actually we have uh, on, the, on the MOOC environment, we have one session where we ask people also to post good examples, to post links to existing policies, maybe something from your experience. 
rather than than mentioning a country because I don't like doing that at all. <laughs> um, I don't even like talking about my own country <laughs> as well because it's uh, because policy is so diverse and in reality each good practice. I think what each project has its good its, its strengths and weaknesses, and also I mean it, you can't just take one practice and put it in another in in in, a, in another context. I mean because each context is unique. So the idea is just to have a look to learn more and then try and use your imagination and your your innovative skills to try and come up with something unique for your particular context. But I mentioned two places where um, the people who have joined us are the, and the people who will see these videos uh, to look for more information. And this is the European Youth um, Knowledge Center, which is under the partnership and over and within, which is an online platform really, and there are a number of publications there with different practices and there are also and a there's also a lot of information with in this European Youth Knowledge Centre which um, whoever is following this can read and find about. And there's also um, a new thing which is not so new anymore, which is called the Youth Wiki. Um, and if, you, if uh, people Google Youth Wiki, um, it's also another platform which uh, um, gives an overview of what's happening in the different countries in Europe um, with regards to their policy and with, the, with regards to different areas of, of policy. So it's also a very good read to find out um, and also go through the links and read the different good practices that there are over there. And, the, and another website which it would be interesting to access is the youthpolicy.org, um, which again, this is, this is not only based uh, on countries in Europe, but there is also other countries and across the globe. And that would also be interesting to to look into and read more and see what practices each and country is using and what can be adopted to your own situation. And ideally, I mean, I've got, let me try and share. I, I mean, I have two slides which yeah. might be interesting to share. And meanwhile, um, I just informed that I posted the three links to all the three uh, sources that you mentioned. Yes, thank you. Um, and, so, um, and I invite also people to really explore a lot of materials in the in the MOOC environment because we're posting plenty of links of uh, either examples or actually guidelines. Um, if youth yeah, policy doesn't I mean, exist or it's not formalized, actually, what are the first steps to start building your policy? I mean, what I was. I prepared two. I prepared some more slides, which I, I'm not going to go through, but I prepared mm. two slides, which perhaps people might. Um, Want, it's what hinders and what's, uh, what's uh, important uh, for youth policy and perhaps it's uh, um, some pointers which people have to think about. Let me see if I manage to share them. Do, do I get yeah. no? Yeah, Are we can they, see it. Uh, but let me just, let me just go rather than no. Yeah. This was an idea of uh, how that implementation is a good, a big word, because uh, it's not easy changing the, as you could see the picture over here, it's not <laughs> easy changing what's on paper to, to, to practice. But uh, I mean, I have uh, two, like I see a mistake here. I have two um, slides which would be interesting in a way to think about is that what helps, what helps and what makes a policy better, which is a shared vision for determining action and good mechanisms for intergovernmental service and also non-governmental co coordination. Another one is the strategy for measuring outcomes. I mean, and some systematic mechanisms for reviewing and realigning services based on the needs and aspirations and expectations of youth. 
and then of course it's the sharing of good practices between uh, and the different stakeholders uh, and the other one what hinders is really is really working in silos working in all, all on our own a lack of overarching vision and i think this is really something which we forget all about i mean because we really end up working in silos if it's people working like me at a ministerial level we're working in our ministry speaking people working in NGOs they're working in NGOs and we sometimes no matter what how much we say we are interested we're never interested in what others are doing and therefore we end up have, having our own vision rather than an, an overarching vision I mean of course there's a lack of political commitment and this has to come, be lobbied through all the different stakeholders and usually that comes from the grassroots rather from um, top bottom but it's bottom up um, lack of adequate resources lack of a strong partnership between the key stakeholders uh, again we think that we are working together but many times we do not work together everybody's talking of what's in it for me rather than what's the best for young people and um, the lack of active participation of young people at all stages of the policy circle i mean we always say that young people participate they, we need to include them we, but young people need to include also themselves and want to participate themselves and another thing which i have not mentioned and um at all and we many times forget is the lack of training for those working in the youth field and in reality this is why we're doing this mock training so because the more we read the more we learn i mean the more we can be competent in uh, in uh, really trying de uh, to develop policy and implement it uh, because uh, and i stop here i'm ready to answer more questions but i stop here i mean you might i put this picture up because in reality we can have a nice document and that's the ship that i have here but we can just leave it there without sailing we can let it sail but we can also end up instead of leaving it here bring it back to shore and just let it crumble and this this is what policy documents happen to them many times they end up going back to shore we make try to make them sail but that just let them get them back to shore and just let them crumble and i think this is something that uh, unless we really have an overarching vision really work in partnership that ship will never be able to sail us thanks a lot miriam for your thoughts and actually we just have last uh, couple of minutes yeah. left uh I think you did manage to answer quite a number of questions so far. Uh, there were a few more questions uh, coming up on the very last moment, uh, like very country specific things. Um, but then uh, I would recommend people actually to uh, go online to join our online course um, discussions because uh, in the module two, which is open now, and there will be uh, the next module three, which will go deeper into different domains of youth policies uh, including participation of young people which seems like got uh, a big response today um, you will have opportunity really to um, to go deeper to discuss to find a lot of content so we ask you also to um, to participate actively I will uh, paste a link to a discussion forum where we're gonna put the recording of that webinar um, so then you will be able to find it and then continue discussions there but then now i'd like to um yeah express one, my appreciation to miriam for your yeah, no, mm -hmm. one one i see one question just before i leave i mean <laughs> yes? which i did you policy software evaluated on national level how you monitor and evaluate your policy in malta um and in reality yes that's one thing that i in many times we don't evaluate youth policy and um, much because we don't have the time and the money to do this uh, um, because evaluation costs money 
I mean, one thing on what we do in Malta is that we have an interministerial committee which gets together to try and see what's tries to get together at least twice a year and uh, sort of goes through our policy action and see where we are and where we are not uh, and how much each ministry has worked on that particular um, policy action. Um, but I also sort of, and then there is a, a yearly report on what happens with regards um, to youth policy um, during that particular year and at the end it's the final evaluation um, but I, whoever is asking that question I also would like I said I don't ask I don't really mention countries and so on but uh, um, I would also encourage them to look at how um, youth policy is evaluated in Finland and in Estonia they both have a youth monitor which in Malta we do, we, we do not have uh, and uh, get carry also gather also um, statistics at a national level which in Malta we do we do um, gather but it's all fragmented um, and I was just in the GG meeting in Finland and they were showing us on how all these fragmented bits that are gathered on employment on justice and are all in a way compiled in a youth monitor and it would be interesting if uh, um, you can look it up and see um, the way this youth monitor is operating and this is happening both in Finland and in Estonia it is happening in some countries but those are two good practices thank you thanks a lot and actually the monitoring and evaluation aspect is pretty important and we feel it, it, it should be covered more and that is why on November the 5th uh, we're going to have a special webinar focusing in particular on monitoring the implementation and, and evaluating the results of that. So uh, invite everyone to uh, uh, book the date. It's the same time, uh, 2 o'clock Central European time on the 5th of November. And in between there will be a few more webinars that we'll be announcing for the online course participants as well as the, on the partnership um, Facebook page. And uh, I just listed one more time the, uh, the link to the course, if somebody who joined now but you are not in the course. And also I added the, the link uh, to direct link to the discussion where um, you can actually continue asking questions and also answering to each other. And I really appreciate there were a number of people who were also not just asking questions but helping to, to respond to some of the questions that, that were there during today's webinar. So thank you very much, uh, Miriam, for, uh, you. for your time, for your thoughts, for your experiences. It was a pleasure. <laughs> and thanks a lot thank to, to everyone who joined today. Have a good day, everyone. We hope this video contributed to your learning about youth policy.